hi, hello. Hello and welcome to Ponderland. Tonight on Ponderland, we are talking about class. There are different types of classes, work class, up class, middle class, right? Once you're famous, though, like how I am, I'm famous now, you know who I am, don't you? Well, I'm famous, right? Well, I don't know who you are. Stop watching them. Fuck off. We don't need you, <laughs> right? Being famous, it elevates you above your birth class. You enter into a new class, class of celebrity. It's a little bit alienating in a way. Another way, it's quite good. Right, listen to this sort of, here's bad thing what happened, right? I went to West Ham once, we'll go to West Ham a lot, I've never learned, right? I was at West Ham and like a load of fans came up to me and one bloke goes, oh, 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 oh! I thought, oh, I wonder what class this guy is. Oh! He's communicating entirely through a glottal stop. Oh, 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 oh. oh yeah, West Ham fan, are you? Never saw you here before you were famous. Yeah, but you wouldn't have recognised me. It's not like, oh, at last I'm famous. <laughs> now to Upton Park. <laughs> of the classes, working class, I suppose, is the one I identify with most strongly, although I always feel a little bit outside of it. It's very easy to eulogise and romanticise working class culture. This phenomenon of romanticising the working classes takes place in this documentary about craftsmen, right? The bloke doing the voiceover really romanticises working classes. It's just some blokes really aggressively doing their jobs, right? That's all that's happening. And like the voiceover artist goes, I mean, look at these craftsmen. Look at them. The magic of the craftsmen. That's right, magic. Who really gets into it? God, eh? And there are the odd jobs too that need the personal touch. The magic. That's it. The magic of the craftsman. <laughs> Looks like a right fucking last. Yeah, bastard! <laughs> it's not magic, it's not like they're creating, oh no, a Faberge egg. <laughs> At the end of it, it is just gonna be a lump of smashed in metal, isn't it? Like they're angry with it because it's glowing. Glowing, are you? You think you're better than us, you bastard? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This man is an eloquent poet of the working classes. This is a bin man. He's on the dust. I'm on the dust. You on the dust. He's an articulate, eloquent dustbin man, right? And he's talking about his position and how people judge him for being a dustbin man. And I think, yeah, that's really good. You've really made me think differently about being a dustbin man, right? But then he just conducts a needless attack on a national treasure. I don't know why, but it's the class system hitting you in the face again, isn't it, really? I mean, if that's how people want to think, then that's fine, you know. You don't have to be what people think. You know, you can get away from that. I mean, Sean Connery playing R07 is not R07. You want him to be like it, so you assume that that's where he is. He might be totally different, he might be queer. I'll be queer all I know. I don't know if he's queer or is it queer? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think he's having a go at him or anything. But like, also, why does he go 007? Oh, I think the whole world knows that he's called 007. I think we've agreed, have we? 007 and shut. Ooh, seven! <laughs> this bloke, however, is a fine example of a man so ludicrously privileged, such a fine emblem of the upper classes, that he thinks that only he should be able to make any decisions and that democracy should be made tiny like a mouse's hand. <laughs> but basically, women shouldn't be allowed to vote. Uh, come to that. I don't think too many men should either. <laughs> the working class, I mean, it, it is absurd for the working class to vote. Because they don't understand what they're voting for. <laughs> Basically, the voting ought to be limited to basically people myself and a few of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's too restrictive for a democracy. Me and a few of my friends. Not all of my friends. Edward used the wrong butter knife last week. <laughs> we can't trust him to vote. I like that when he goes, working class people, they would be confused by voting. <laughs> they'll go into that booth, they'll think it's a Punch and Judy booth. <laughs> they'll expect a show. They would vote for ridiculous people. I want to vote for Kenny Birdseye. 
I want the Jolly Green Giant to be Chancellor of the Shigger. <laughs> Here, why can't I vote for the Milky Bar Kid? <laughs> the Treaty of Versailles is on me! <laughs> But also, I get the impression that that posh bloke, right, is uh, being subjected to... Sometimes when you're making a television programme, if you realise someone's a little bit of a dickhead, you think, we can really exploit this person. <laughs> right, so they've gone to... Mm, yeah, that whole arsehole thing you're doing is absolutely fantastic. Can you give us more? Oh, yes, yeah, there's plenty more where that came from. <laughs> have a look at him being a proper arsehole for telly. And also, have a look, do, do notice his pyjamas. Do observe those. <laughs> How come you keep going and shooting these silly little birds? I've told you before, Harold. Pheasants are bred to be shot, they enjoy it. That's the same way as Labradors enjoy retrieving and are bred for it. Welshmen are bred to dig coal. The working class are bred to look after young gentlemen like myself. <laughs> Difficult to take you quite so seriously when you've got Rupert the Bear pyjamas. <laughs> I hate Rupert and hated him as a child because Rupert the Bear belongs very much to the genre of children's entertainment that's sort of actually about sort of educating and conditioning you. Oh, it's Rupert the Bear! What a little boffin! What a <laughs> featureless little boffin! If it weren't for that eye, his whole head just looks like a spilt corn. It. <laughs> what kind of cartoon character has trousers that are more famous than his head? <laughs> What kind of public figure would allow his trousers or haircut to be the most famous thing <laughs> about them? Ludicrous. <laughs> so that posh bloke there, he has to take complete responsibility for his class. He is a nasty symbol of his class. And you can condemn him, and I do condemn him and his pyjamas. These posh kids, you can't, like, hate a posh little child, can you? Because it's still basically a child. It's still in the genre of child. I have heard people that are nouveau riche resent their own children. Like, they've got riche later in life. Oh, I'm really riche. When did you become riche? Nouveau, right? <laughs> they resent their own children because they have to live in the house with a posh child. <laughs> what, mate? Why? How's it going? Daddy, why do you talk like that? <laughs> you little mug! <laughs> But you can't dislike a posh child because these posh children have clearly been indoctrinated into their views. So funny, look at this little boy talking about cockneys, right? He talks about cockneys in a totally pejorative way, as if cockneys are sort of like a race or a social group. It's bizarre. When I go past schools, comprehensives, there are lots of bullies, the, um, cockneys, you know, I, I don't know kind of environment. Cockneys, gypsies, Ewoks, everywhere I go, gypsies, transatees, people in the town will call us. That's <laughs> really ridiculous. Then, like, his mate picks up the baton of loopy Cockney ignorance and Cockney race hate, right? It's all right. Uh, if you see a Cockney, don't approach it, it might bite you. <laughs> if you cut a Cockney open, it's just all full of straw. <laughs> They really are. They're so behind. Even if they were 16, we're 13 nearly. We're still ahead of them in French and science and various other subjects. So if we got there, we'd be at the stage of GCSE with them. So it wouldn't be that good. We'd be like Einstein's compared to them. <laughs> we're like Einstein's compared to a cockney. <laughs> If you see a cockney, like, I don't know, perhaps you see Barbara Windsor, if you're afraid, you must run away from her, but run in a zigzag. <laughs> this will confuse Barbara Windsor. <laughs> if you see a cockney that's fallen from its nest, don't touch it or feed it, because otherwise the mum won't come back to it. <laughs> Interrelationship between the classes is an interesting facet of our national class system, right? I think butlers are fascinating, right? Because a butler cannot be posh, can he? Because otherwise, why would you do that job if you're posh? But they seem like the poshest people in the world, don't they? They're so posh. Oh, hello. Like, they've removed all individuality. I suppose, because if you've got a butler in your house, you don't want him being, all right, mate, how'd you go? All right. <laughs> or like a really sort of gay butler. I'm like, oh, bloody hell, look at you. Your tits look massive. Jamie, do your head in, wouldn't it? We can see here some butlers being trained, but look at their training. It looks totally pointless. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good, Good night, night, my lord. Good night, my lady. Good night, sir. Good night. It's a pleasure, sir. 
It's a pleasure, sir. I'll do that immediately. I'll do that immediately, I'll do that immediately sir. Good night, ma'am. Good night, madam. Good night, sir. Immediately, Good night, sir. You mean smile, dog? Smile. I don't want you to... I don't want you to... Oh, fuck it! Just wandering around with a glass on your head, being all obedient. That's no good. That's stupid. That's just a pointless party trick, isn't it? You don't think, oh, the butler's got, oh, and he got good balance. That's lovely. <laughs> right? Um, Jerry, I think I saw Clifton meddling in Annabelle's knicker drawer. Well, yes, but have you seen him doing limbo dancing? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> But there can be positive interaction between the classes. This is lovely. This is working class bloke, right, has somehow got himself involved in the super posh world of polo. And he has to justify polo clearly on a daily basis to his friends. Because they must think, well, why are you, what are you doing polo for? What are you doing polo for? Like when I go back to Essex, what are you talking about that for? What are you talking about that for? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> What are you talking about that for? Why are you playing polo, you Nancy? And look at him trying to justify polo. It descends into a series of farcical lies and exaggerations. I can assure you I've played the game and I've played it hard. So hard I finished up on the floor with a horse on top of me with a fractured leg, with the horse unconscious and six blokes pulling the horse off by its tail. That's, that's how easy it is. That's a lie. That's a definite lie. And no, why, why would you ever pull a horse off someone by its tail? That's from cartoons. That's ridiculous, isn't it? He continues with his bonkers tirade on the pitfalls of polo. They're all borrowed from Warner Brothers cartoons. It can kill you, it can drive you mad, it can smash your arms, your legs, your face. I've seen a ball hit a man in the face and have had to get a, a spoon to push it down the front to push his cheekbone in. <laughs> did you? Did that really happen? Pushed it, I pushed it down with a spoon. That is from a cartoon. No, it ain't. Polo is well dangerous. Another time, one of my mates, he touched this electric cable. His whole body went light up like that and I'll see his skeleton underneath all his hair. <laughs> Another time I was playing polo with some geezer, he got it on the head, then loads of birds and stars <laughs> went round his head like that. One time I got it on the head playing polo, got a big bump on my head, I pushed it down, another bump come up there. Yeah. Welcome back to Ponderland. We're talking about class. The world of hunting is exclusively upper class, although I did have a go at hunting once, and it is brilliant. Not animals, they didn't kill animals, just bits of clay out of the sky. And you can see why people get into it, because it's a proper laugh, right? You sort of think, oh, the satisfaction of seeing something destroyed is something you could easily edge towards from shooting a little clay disc to, well, do we really need so many rabbits? <laughs> I'll just kick that one into a river. <laughs> I'll just get an owl and punch it in the stomach. <laughs> ah! I'm vegetarian, I'd never do that. But posh people love hunting, they can't get enough of the world of hunting. Ah, hunting, the pageantry, the gallant fox hunt, the smell of the mid-morning air, Reynard, glory, death, honour, hunting. <laughs> The shouts and the bugle calls made by the huntsman and the whipper in are signals used to communicate with the hounds. That's just screeching. It just sounds like his tie has got caught accidentally on a bus. So... This whole scene took place at a hunting protest when, you know, when Tony Blair was going to ban hunting. I think he did or something. I don't, I don't remember about politics. It's all an illusion. Right? <laughs> so, like, there's going to be a hunting ban and everything. And then posh protesters burn the bill. But, like, if you listen carefully, you can hear one person who's particularly enjoying the protest. One thing to say to Tony Blair. If that's his idea of democracy, you can go float in the flames of hell. <laughs> So that's a 
rubbish speech, Tony Blair can go and float in the flames of hell. That'd be all right, I think. Woo, yeah! <laughs> You're not actually in the flames. I'd like that. Hey, you poor suckers! <laughs> Live a better life next time! Also, one aspect of this protest is particularly adolescent. This bloke, he thinks, Hold on a minute, there's a protest going on here. I've got a real opportunity to get sank off my chest. He's not even a proper posh person. You can tell by the way he protests. <laughs> there, take that, society. <laughs> At least it was quite a good bit of spitting. Like, he didn't go... Ooh, come and, <laughs> well, what I meant was, down with bloody Tony Blair's. <laughs> this is a beautiful piece of communication here, but by someone at the other end of the class spectrum. This bloke's out hunting and shooting. What could be posher than that? And he's trying to locate someone who I suspect strongly he has accidentally shot. He's got a friend <laughs> called Jeffrey, and he's going, uh, where's Jeffrey? Where is Jeffrey? And he's trying to release the information in a really tactful and sensitive way, right? Um, one, two, oh God, oh no, <laughs> Jeffrey's dead. He's, he's definitely killed Jeffrey. Have a look. One, two, three, four. Uh, um. <laughs> Uh, 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 Jeffrey, uh, well, what number are you? Four. Uh, who is five or six? Oh. Uh, five. Just admit you've killed Jeffrey. Four. 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 Yes. Uh, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Were any of you particularly attached to Jeffrey? <laughs> if I keep counting, perhaps Jeffrey will return. <laughs> Let's remember Jeffrey for the man he was and not the corpse that he isn't. He's not a corpse. <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> so, because there is such distinction between the language of our different classes in our culture, working class, posh folks, some people have become obsessed with phonetics and semantics and semiotics and manner and means of communication. And this man is at the very frontier, pushing forward the study of language with his brilliant machine. How are you, mate? How are you, mate? John Bernard likes to measure the nuances of the Australian accent scientifically. There are many differences between London English and Australian English. In general, Australians sound the H. If you regard the dropping of an H as a Cockney feature, then this is a difference between Cockney and Australian English. How are you, mate? This is the rubbish version of Knight Rider. How are you, mate? How are you, mate? trouble just to invent a machine that asks you how you are <laughs> in a slovenly way. How are you, mate? How are you, mate? I think that man is just desperately lonely and has created a machine to have casual conversation with him. How are you, mate? Where are you, mate? Why are we, mate? <laughs> The lottery, of course, makes a mockery of class, although you cannot buy class. That is why people are so pissed off about Mikey Carroll winning the lottery, right? Because he's a yobbo. But Mikey Carroll is the perfect lottery winner. That's who you want to win a lottery. It's a lottery. Give it to a poor person. They don't want rich, genteel people winning the lottery. Pointless. Right? This really pissed off Anglia television to the point where they've decided to create a trumped-up kangaroo court to decide Mikey Carroll, bad or sad. But those two ideas are not mutually exclusive. It's possible to be both bad 
and sad, right? You cannot build a penal judicial system around rhyme just because something rhymes. Oh, Michael Jackson, bad or mad? <laughs> Maybe both. James Stewart, cad or Harry's dad? <laughs> First, let's hear the case for the defence from Barrister Matthew McNiff. Ladies and gentlemen, there can be little doubt that there is one person out there who wants me to fail in my task. On that day back in 2002, Michael Carroll was handed 9.7 million golden opportunities. A pound is not a golden opportunity. <laughs> not on his own. Mum, I'm off to the everything's a golden opportunity shop. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Michael Carroll had, at one time, the Midas touch. Well, even that word tells us something about him. Because if you rearrange the letters of the word Midas, you get, I'm sad. <laughs> what? You can't base justice on rhymes and anagrams. <laughs> And the other, the other lawyer is properly gutted about that. Oh, shit, that Midas thing, that's brilliant! <laughs> and what's really good, look at this next bit. This next bit's really lovely. By some bizarre twist in the vortex of our universe, one woman is sat diagonally up from her own future. The only thing that could hold him back was his imagination. <laughs> and sadly, it did. Of it, they've told the people in that audience that they are a jury, and all of them are taking it really seriously. Oh no, we are in a jury. We better. Well, is he bad or sad? I mean, you know. <laughs> There's only one woman, the woman in front, black woman. She's the only person that thinks, well, this is fucking ridiculous. Look at her face. <laughs> Everyone else is like, oh, he's definitely bad or sad, but he's definitely saying, have a look. Would you now please give us your verdicts? <laughs> well, the jury split. One, two, three, four, five, six. Say he's sad. The other half dozen say he's bad. That perhaps just about sums up the Michael Carroll story. Well, that's what our studio jury felt. How about you? Vote now in our poll. 25p? I'm not paying that. That's quarter of a golden opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. <clears throat> what this man is... What has happened? Right, we'll do this bit again, OK? <laughs> and it's going to blow your fucking socks off. But just to make it all worthwhile, I'll give you a little glimpse of my private parts. <laughs> no, don't put your hand up for it. Do you think by putting your hand up, I might drift towards you? Hello.